Welcome back to my smart learning. This is a lesson for year 12s. This is our last lesson on the uh, section on the heart. Uh, it's still chapter seven, but um, we've got plant stuff coming after this. Cardiovascular disease. So what causes heart disease? That's the thing that we're focusing on this lesson. But as you know, we always like to start with our recall quiz, our quick quiz, recall quick quiz, high five, to get our virtual high five. So number one, what is the liquid that surrounds and bathes the cells? Number two, pressure caused by water pushing against something. So when wa water is pushing against the sides of the blood vessels, what is that kind of, uh, what's that called? Number three, water moves passively due to what? So water will move passively from one place to place by what process or what's causing that. Number four, the excess fluid that isn't drained uh, back into your blood system, where does it go? And number five, kawashiko or edema can be caused by, what's it caused by? So press pause, just check your answers and we'll start right back. Okay, so number one, the liquid that surrounds the cells is known as tissue fluid. That was our last lesson, tissue fluid. The pressure caused by water pushing on something is known as hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure. Number three, water moves passive due to the osmotic pressure, osmotic potential, also known as water potential. Number four, the excess fluid, where is it drained? Most of it goes back into the blood, but some of it, that's uh, the extra that can't get back into the bloodstream, ends up in the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system. Now, if you recall, when it's in the blood, the liquid is called plasma. When the water drains out, now we have to use the word water, not the plasma leaking out, because you lose marks if you say plasma. It's the water from the plasma that drains out, goes into, because due to the hydrostatic pressure surrounding the cells. Now it's known as tissue fluid. And then the tissue fluid the excess water and tissue fluid will drain into the lymphatic system and now it's known as lymph. And number five, kawashiko, we talked about it um, uh, last time. If there's a lack of protein, so lack of protein in the diet can lead to uh, kawashiko where you get the distended stomachs. So what we're we focusing on today, data and disease, learning objectives. How are data on disease analyzed? What is correlation? How is a causal link established? What is risk and how is it measured? And factors affecting the risk of heart disease, in particular coronary heart disease, CHD. So key terms then, we really need to get our heads around it. This is quite a fundamental idea in biology. What do we mean by a trend or a pattern? Well, it's a description of the relationship shown in a graph between using two sets of data What's analysis or how do we analyze? Well, it's the examination carefully to make an overall interpretation of data. Correlation, co-relation, correlation. It's a relationship between two variables. Well, is there a correlation? Cause, very important thing between the difference between cause and correlation. Cause is the evidence to prove a relationship that one thing has caused the other thing to change. And risk is the probability or the chance or the consequences of one thing affecting something else. So you really need to understand these key fundamental ideas. So how reliable is data then? How do we know that if there's been an epidemiological study, whether it's, for instance, it does smoking cause cancer, how do we know that the data is reliable? Can we draw conclusions based on the data? Is it valid? So the kind of questions that you need to think about when collecting evidence and data. Well, how was that data collected? For example, uh, were the methods reliable? Was the correct apparatus used? Did we uh, collect it in a reliable way? Has it been contaminated? Who went to collect it? How was it collected? Has the right fact to be measured? Have we actually been measuring the right thing? Has the completely wrong thing been measured? Have the correct questions been asked? Am I actually in, you know, looking at the right question or am I going down the wrong path? 
are there suitable number of repeats? How many people have we asked? An epidemiological study, is it going to be a valid set of data if I'm asking, you know, if I'm comparing 10 people or am I asking a whole, uh, you know, thousands of people within the population? And has the data been collected without bias? Have the people been chosen at random or have I selected particular people knowing that that's going to skew my data? So these are the things that we need to think about when we're drawing conclusions on the reliability on data. And I'll touch upon each of those as we go through this lesson. So correlation and causation. The correlation is the relationship between two variables, but does not necessarily mean causation, which I'll come on to in a second. If you just pause the video very quickly, can you just quickly draw, sketch a graph, what a positive correlation would look like on a graph, and what a negative correlation would look like on a graph. If you press pause and just have a quick sketch of what that would look like, we'll start back in a second. So if you've drawn that, if you've got an X and Y axis, if it's a positive correlation, it should be quite straightforward. You should have a line going up on your graph. If you've got a negative correlation, you should have a line going down on your graph. If there's no correlation, then the line will actually just be flat. Okay, especially if it's a scatter graph, the scatter would be scattering up for a positive correlation. For a negative correlation, the scatter should be scattering down. And no correlation, it should be just scattered everywhere. So, what do I mean? Does correlation mean causation? No, it doesn't. A correlation shows a link between two factors, for instance, smoking and cancer, but it doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't prove that the smoking has caused the cancer. That's just a correlation. There could be other factors involved. So it could be, it could be somebody's, their genes. It could be um, uh, something else it, to do with their genetics, for instance, or it could be to do with um, their job. They might be breathing in polluted, polluting gases and so on. So correlation does not mean causation. It could be due to other factors. So correlation, so for, for example, um, if we think about this, so if I drew a graph and I said um, the, the amount of uh, people with hay fever, okay, or the, the, the number of people with hay fever, the percentage of the population, um, you know, hay fever occurring, compared to the number of ice creams sold. So if I did that, ice creams sold, so more and more people buying ice creams, and the uh, hay fever, and you can see a graph going up like that. Does that mean that the ice cream caused the hay fever? No, it doesn't. It looks like it could be that it's because there's more ice creams being bought, there's more hay fever. There's a correlation, there's a positive correlation between the ice cream sales and the um, hay fever. However, it's not the ice cream that's caused the hay fever. There must be some other factor. There must be another factor that's causing that. Well, if you think about it, when do ice creams get bought more? When do we consume more ice creams? Well, it's during the summer months when it's warmer. When do people have more hay fever? You don't get hay fever really in the winter. So it's in the summer months. So you could explain it with other factors. So the causation, how would, how would I prove that it wasn't the ice cream that's caused the hay fever, what, what I'd have to do is I'd have to collect evidence. So I might have to get some, um, test it on people or test it on cells and tissues, the chemicals in the ice cream, um, and see if it causes in a reaction on the cells and I can test it on people to see, is it the, the milk in the ice cream or the, the vanilla flavoring in the ice cream? Test the individual ingredients to see if it's caused the hay fever. And then that's how I get a causal link. So um, if I did another graph and I said the amount of pollen or the, months, you know, the amount of pollen and the amount of hay fever, I might still get a positive correlation, but I can actually get a causal link. I can show that the pollen has caused the hay fever by looking at the allergic reaction caused by the pollen on, on people or on tissues or so on. So we just have to make sure we don't get confused between correlation and causal link. And an example would be here. So, for instance, the amount of cigarettes smoked by men and the amount of lung cancer in men, if we look at these two graphs, they look almost identical in their pattern. 
So it looks like there's a trend. Does this graph prove that smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer? Well, it doesn't prove it, but there is a strong correlation that there must be some kind of link between them. So what I'd have to do, how could I improve the reliability of this data? I'd have to get cigarettes, get the chemicals inside cigarettes, which are hundreds, which makes it very, very difficult. And I'd have to test those chemicals on cells and then on live animals to see, or to see is there something in those cigarette smoke that is causing the lung cancer? And then that's when I could make the causal link when there is a correlation between two sets of data. So, um, causal link and correlation are not exactly the same thing. Now, correlation is not causation. Correlation can imply a potential cause, just like the, the lung cancer and the cigarette smoking, but it doesn't mean. As the incidence of smoking goes up, the rate of lung cancer increases. This doesn't prove that smoking causes lung cancer. I need to collect experimental evidence and uh, just check the chemicals to see if they're cancerous to lung cells and exposing them then to, uh, to animals and then getting some scientific evidence. Because we can base it around anecdotal evidence. For instance, I can say, Granny smoked two boxes of cigarettes a day. She smoked, you know, I don't know, she smoked 100 cigarettes a day every day and she never got cancer. She lived a normal life up to the age of 100. So smoking doesn't cause cancer. That's anecdotal because if you did 100,000 people, then you'd find that more people would gain cancer. So we can't say that for sure. We can't use anecdotal evidence. So when we do collect data and evidence, and we'll look at correlation, in epidemiological studies, to make it more reliable, we need to test it on thousands of people so over a, lo and over a very, very long period of time until we have enough evidence to say there is a causal link. And then we, you know, for instance, smoking does cause cancer. Uh, I'm not saying smoking doesn't cause cancer, because smoking does cause cancer because there are a lot of carcinogens in there, in the chemicals. It takes a long time to, uh, you know, get the government to ban smoking. It took years and years and decades to get the government to slowly uh, ban smoking in public places and the packaging and all those kind of things. Now, what we're focusing on though is heart disease, CHD, stands for coronary heart disease, and or you can call it cardiovascular disease. So what's the link between this dude and coronary heart disease? Well, eating burgers in the sun doesn't look like a good idea because you'll end up like that. So, risk then. What's the risk of him getting heart disease? Well, what is risk? Well, risk is a concept of what's the probability of you getting something. So risk is a measure of the probability the damage to health will occur as a result of a given hazard. So eating too many burgers increases his risk of heart disease. It doesn't mean he will definitely get it, you know, but the more burgers you eat, you know, the more Dixies or Big John's on the way home from school, not a good idea because it's going to increase your risk of heart disease. It doesn't mean you will definitely get it. It's like the whole anecdotal evidence. You could say, well, I had a fried chicken on the way home every day. I never got heart disease. But if you look at the population as a whole, the more data you collect, you can see that fast foods, smoking, um, alcohol, a lack of exercise, all these things increases your risk of coronary heart disease. It's one of the biggest killers. Uh, in the world, especially in the Western developed nations. So that's what risk is. The concept of risk has two elements, the chance of an event happening, e.g. high chance of catching a cold, or the consequence that event, uh, of that event, e.g. a mild illness uh, that we recover from it. So if that's why we've got the social distancing right now. That's why I'm teaching your lessons using my TV from home. I'm not with a projector, you know, with a smart screen from school, because we've been all told to be uh, isolated, socially isolated, or keeping our social distancing away from each other, and that's reducing the risk. Okay, it's reducing the, the, the spread of the disease and reducing the risk of us catching the disease and reducing the, um, the pressure on our NHS. So, how do we measure it? We measure risk by uh, a value ranging from zero to a hundred percent, or it could be from zero to one. So either 0% being no harm and 100% will be 100% definite chance of it happening. Risk is often relative. It's measured by comparing those exposed to harm with those 
not exposed to the harm, e.g. there's 15 times more greater chance of a smoker will develop cancer than a non-smoker. So we tend to do it that way. Time scale. The health risks are more meaningful when given a time scale, e.g. risk of dying is 100% because obviously we're all going to die. If that's a spoiler alert, I'm sorry, but it's going to happen. It's a bit morbid, but it's going to happen at some point. Um, but if a time scale is attached to it, e.g. 100% uh, in the next two years is a lot more meaningful, a more, lot more inf informative. Okay, so what are risk factors then? Risk factors are, even when a risk is quantified, there are many factors to be considered for a better understanding of risk, e.g. 15 times more chance of a smoker developing lung cancer compared to a non-smoker. The following questions need to be asked. Over what time period are we talking about? How does the number of cigarettes smoke uh, a day affect this figure? Do stress levels uh, and alcohol intake, your job, your occupation, your gender, pollution or other factors have an influence? So one factor might influence another factor. Does it, does it change according to where the smokers live, e.g. the climate, the countryside, the city and country and so on? So risk factors can be associated with other risk factors. So now we're going to look at the risk factors for coronary heart disease. Um, so let's look at this graph. Smokers, okay, what's the chance of getting lung cancer from smoking? If you've stopped smoking, if you never smoked in the first place, your chance of getting lung cancer is very, very, very small because you never smoked. But it doesn't mean it's 0% because you might still get lung cancer, unfortunately, but the risk of you getting lung cancer is a lot less. When I was at school, uh, there used to be a TV show called Record Breakers and a chap called Roy Castle. He got lung cancer and he never smoked a cigarette in his life. But he used to play in nightclubs, he used to play, um, I think it was a saxophone or a trombone, I think he used to play. And he used to take deep breaths of the passive smoke in the nightclubs. And he got lung cancer when he didn't smoke one cigarette in his life. So, never smoked, but you still got a very, 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 very small chance of, of getting contracting lung cancer. But the more you smoke, or the longer you leave it to stop, right? So current smokers, the higher the percentage chance of getting lung cancer, okay? So, and you can see it starts to accelerate. So risk factors then. We're looking at coronary heart disease. So you know what your coronary arteries are. They, they supply the blood to the heart, giving it oxygen and glucose because it's a very active muscle. If you restrict that oxygen anyhow, or any of that glucose, you're uh, asphyxiating, you're reducing oxygen getting to those cells. So those cells will die. And it will lead to what we call a myocardial infarction. This is the academic language, the hospital language, the medical language for a heart attack. We just call it a heart attack. The correct term is myocardial infarction. That is a heart attack. Why does that happen? Well, the cells in your heart aren't getting any oxygen. They're not getting any glucose. They can't aerobically respire, causing stress on the heart. The cells die. The heart can't contract and pump properly and get the blood around your body. So what kinds of things are the risk factors associated with it. The ones next to the star are the ones in your textbook that it goes into a lot of detail. I'll go through the other ones more briefly. So your age, obviously the older you get, the more aging there is on your blood vessels. It's increasing your risk of, of heart disease. Okay, it's gonna make it harder for your blood to pump smoothly around your body. Your gender, unfortunately men are at higher risk of getting heart disease than women. Women tend to live a bit longer than men. Your genes, it could be your genetic information. Some people are prone genetically to have a higher blood pressure and there's nothing they can do about it. Okay, it's just part of their, their genes. So you can have a higher chance of having heart disease. You can try to mitigate that but um, by having a healthier lifestyle and that will reduce your risk factors but um, ultimately your genes will um, be a huge factor. But obviously if you have a poor lifestyle, you're just doubling your chance or increasing your chances a lot more getting that heart attack uh, a lot sooner rather than later. Um, physical activity, obviously, and obesity kind of linked together. The picture I showed you of that chap eating his burgers, the, there's a correlation, well, it's the risk factor, the higher, the greater the obesity, the greater the, uh, the risk of heart disease and coronary heart disease and heart attacks, myocardial infarction. Why? Because obesity, obesity is linked to your diet and your diet is linked to increased levels of salt and fat in your diet. Obesity is linked to the lack of physical activity because exercise will be burning off those extra calories, burning off that fat, strengthening your heart, your cardiovascular system, uh, increasing your lung capacity, getting more oxygen, 
and obviously over around uh, good for your health, your physical health and your mental health. But you know, a lack of exercise will lead to this, the obesity, because if you have a poor diet. Now you've got to be careful when we say diet, because diet in itself, in your example, you say poor diet, it doesn't give you enough information, it's too generic. So in A-levels, you need to be very, very specific with your language. When you say diet, and even you say poor diet, you need to say what is it about your diet that's causing the problem. So for heart disease, the problem here is salt. Salt will, high levels of salt will increase blood pressure. High levels of saturated fat. Now here we're talking about LDLs, because you've got two types of uh, cholesterols here. The, uh, the LDLs are the ones that cause the problem, not the HDLs. I'll come back to those in a second. So your diet will cause the, the high blood pressure. So why does high blood pressure increase your risk of heart disease? Well, if the pressure is already high in the bloodstream, it's going to make it difficult for the heart to contra uh, contract and allow the blood to flow through. Because you want to have a pressure gradient. You want it to be high one place and low somewhere else. So that if you've got a pressure gradient, you can pump that blood really quickly to where it needs to get to, get the oxygen glucose to where it needs to get to. If you've got high there and high there, you haven't got that huge pressure gradient. So you're not going to get that blood pumping nicely around the body. Um, so you're not getting the oxygen glucose to the heart tissue. So it's gonna, the cells are going to die and so it's going to cause the, the heart attack. So high blood pressure is bad news. Also, the high blood pressure makes it so that the walls of the artery and the elastic fibers having to withstand that pressure. And what tends to happen is the, the lining starts to thicken. It becomes more tougher. And if it becomes tougher, it makes it harder for the blood to flow smoothly around the body and therefore causing more stress on the heart and therefore leading to heart disease. So that's your blood pressure. Now, what can also lead to high blood pressure is the amount of cholesterol in your diet. There's two types of cholesterol. There's HDLs, high density lipoproteins. Now, the, the cholesterol is important. We can't have zero cholesterol in our diet because cholesterol is needed to make cell surface membranes. Okay. Um, now, well, the ones that we want are little of the LDLs, the low density lipoproteins, and we want more of the HDLs, high density lipoproteins. The high density lipoproteins take away the excess cholesterols from your tissues, from your cells, take it to your liver, and your liver will break those down and excrete them out of your body. Whereas the LDLs, okay, the LDLs are the ones where they go from your liver to your tissues. Now that's the problem, because if they go to your tissues, they will build up in your tissues, and especially in your blood vessels. If they build up in the inner lining, so between your endothelium, remember that's the inner lining of your, uh, where your lumen is, you've got your endothelium in your arteries and in your veins, and the lining in between is your muscle li li lining and your elastic fibers. If you get fat building up in there, your cholesterol building up in there, you get these little plaques, okay? And these little uh, plaques make it your uh, arteries tougher and thicker, and you end up with little, uh, you can end up with aneurysms because you get these bulges inside, and which can rupture and cause an aneurysm, which can cause a bleeding in the brain, which can lead to a stroke and things like that. Um, and also, if it's these aneurysms cause the bulging inside the tiny, tiny blood vessels, the uh, coronary arteries around your heart, and that reduces the blood flow to the heart tissue, to the cardiac tissue, reducing the oxygen and the glucose to your cardiac cells. Now, if your cardiac cells can't get oxygen and glucose, they can't aerobically respire, those heart cells will die, and that's gonna to lead to a heart attack. And one of the main things that they use, obviously, to reduce your cholesterol is statins, so the doctors might prescribe you statins, but once you're on those statins, you're on it for pretty much for the rest of your life, so you don't wanna be on those. Um, and also, um, if you do have a heart attack, what they might have to do is a bypass operation where they would connect one part of your coronary arteries, go around where the blockage has been caused and divert the blood around the coronaries so it can get to the other tissues. Because depending on where, it, where the blockage is, it might cause uh, the cells to die in lower down in the heart or it could be higher up. So you've heard of something like uh, a bypass operation or a double bypass operation or a triple bypass operation. It's like these little roads that are interconnecting and sort of going out. It's how many roads are you bypassing to get to the other bit. So um, that's um, the cholesterol building up, 
That's why uh, it causes um, heart disease and heart attacks. The last one, smoking then. Smoking is the, one of the biggest causes of heart disease around the world. So what's in smoking? Well, you've got all the carcinogens anyway that, that lead to like lung cancer, but it also leads to heart disease. Why? Well, the two main, uh, you know, the two main perpetrators of this from smoking is carbon monoxide and nicotine. So carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas. It comes from incomplete combustion. So if you have complete combustion, when you burn a fuel, you get carbon dioxide and water. However, if you don't have enough oxygen when you're burning something, you get carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide has a high affinity to the hemoglobin compared to oxygen. So instead of oxygen joining on and loading onto your hemoglobin, the carbon monoxide jumps ahead and has a higher affinity. And that's why you get carbon monoxide poisoning. If your boiler hasn't been serviced and there's not complete combustion, and uh, sadly it's happened to a few people when they're on holiday where uh, the boilers hadn't been serviced and not enough oxygen would go in. Uh, they basically didn't wake up. They fell asleep, didn't wake up. Why? Because the carbon monoxide poisoning, it makes your blood go like a cherry red, really bright red. It's, it's basically asphyxiation. It's, it's suffocating you because the carbon monoxide is sticking onto the red blood cells, into the hemoglobin rather than the oxygen. Therefore, you're not getting oxygen to those cells. Those cells die. And that's leading to... Uh, making it more difficult for your heart, your heart has to pump harder, and the more harder you're making it for your heart to beat and to get the blood around, the higher the risk of um, uh, heart disease. Also, the, the nicotine is a stimulant. It causes uh, the release of adrenaline, and adrenaline is a hormone, which gets your heart beating faster. So someone takes a cigarette, smokes a cigarette, the heart starts beating faster, why? Because nicotine is a stimulant. It gets the adrenaline into your bloodstream. The adrenaline gets your heart beating faster. If your heart's beating faster, there's more stress on the system. The, your, the more stretching you get in your arteries and so on, causing them over time to want to get thicker and tougher to withstand that pressure. So your, the body's trying to adapt very, very slowly, but that's causing you, in the long term, more problems. Also, the nicotine can cause the platelets to stick. They coagulate. Coagulation means they stick together and they're causing little clumps in the blood. And those little clumps can cause blockages in the coronary arteries and that can also lead to your myocardial infarction, your heart attack. So, here's a quick graph then. So, showing us the amount of cholesterol in the blood. So, this is the amount of cholesterol below 200, between 200 and 239 and above 239. The blue bars are the men, the red bars are the women. What does this graph show about cholesterol levels and the risk of CHD, coronary heart disease? If you pause the video and see if you can answer that question. Okay, so if you look carefully, you can see that they both have a positive correlation in the sense that the more cholesterol you have in your blood, the higher the risk of coronary heart disease. But what else do we know? Well, men have a higher risk of coronary heart disease compared to women okay so all the guys you need to stop smoking and you need to stop having your mixed grill all right from your usual establishment it could be soho tavern get a shout out there for soho tavern or it could be the grove i don't know where you want to go for your mixed grill um but you can see that too much uh cholesterol so that's why if you're gonna eat meat i'm not telling you all to become vegetarian but if you're gonna eat meat you're better off eating your white meats because your white meats have got lower cholesterol compared to your red meats so your white meat would be chicken but then again, different parts of the chicken. So the chicken breast is more healthier than the chicken leg because the chicken legs tends to be a bit darker, a little bit more cholesterol than the chicken thighs. Chicken breast is more white, tends to dry up more easy, quicker, but uh, it's got less cholesterol. Your red meats are your, your lamb and your beef and things like that, and your duck. Your darker meat, higher levels of cholesterol, okay, and your mince and things like that. So the last thing then, how do I re reduce my risk of cancer and coronary heart disease, the CHD? Well, obviously, reduce your intake of cholesterol, reduce saturated fats in your diet. So when we say healthy diet, you've got to be careful. You can't just say healthy diet. That's too generic, too bland. Not the taste of the food, not bland like that, but you know what I mean. So reduce the amount of cholesterol in your food, reduce the amount of uh, saturated fat, reduce the amount of salt in your diet. Give up smoking or don't smoke at all. Smoking is the big no-no, and that's why the governments have intervened by uh, all those measures they've taken. Avoid becoming overweight, do more exercise, obvious ones. Keep alcohol consumption to a minimum, reduce the alcohol, because that in cause, it increases liver cirrhosis, you get fatty liver, 
alcohol is very high in calories as well. Increasing dietary fiber, because fiber will actually reduce your chance of bowel, bowel cancer and antioxidants in the diet. You need to have more antioxidants like vitamin C in your diet. And we talked about reducing salt intake because that increases blood pressure. Now, I hope that's been useful. That's the end of our section on the heart. Next time I'll see you, we'll be going on to plant biology. We'll be looking at transpiration and translocation, but it's still a part of chapter seven. Uh, if it's been useful for you, please make sure you like the video, you watch the videos. You need to make sure you subscribe and share so that everyone can get some learning done while we're all stuck indoors. Uh, keep safe, keep healthy, and uh, make sure you're washing your hands. And when you're giving high fives, make sure it's a virtual high five. And uh, I'll see you on the next video. Take care.